morning, church. It is wonderful to be here with you this morning. Uh, I love. I, when, we, when I worship in church, I, I remember, and I, it brings just this amazing awareness that we serve a living God who is alive and active and is present here with us. And uh, I'm just grateful to be able to do that with all of you. Um, had our first snow, as you all know, and I, one of the great mysteries to me in life is why the first snow is always so difficult to drive in. Uh, and my theory is, it's, it's, I, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, well, it's because we're out of practice and we're not used to it, and so this is, it, it takes some time to adjust. But I, I know for me that's not true. Uh, I am maybe the best winter driver that's ever been. Uh, I, years ago, when Chantel and I were at school, we went up to Rocky Mountain National Park in our Honda Pilot, and I don't have snow tires or chains on my tires. That's, I think that's for chumps. I think they're just trying, that's an upsell. And uh, I don't need that stuff. And so I'm driving up, and I, I know that they closed Trail Ridge Road at some point, and they're only letting people pass that way that have chains on their tires. And, I never believe people, so I just drive up to it anyway to see if they'll let me through. And they saw my Minnesota plates, and they just waved me through, and it was great. True story. It was like an average Tuesday. Average Tuesday. So yeah, it was just fine. Uh, so anyway, I, I I'm at a loss as to why the first snow is so difficult. I think it just genuinely must be more slippery than at any other point in the winter. I'm not sure. Uh, that's the only thing that makes sense to me. So. Uh, anyway, sorry, uh, let's open in prayer and get to something more meaningful than whatever that was. Um, Father God, Father God, it's good to be in your home today. It's good to be in a place, Lord, where you are dwelling and you are alive and you are active. Um, this is a place, Lord, that is special to us because we've experienced your presence here with us. We've heard from your word, we've uh, sung, Lord, to you, and we uh, have been made aware, Lord, of your deep an endless love for us that is so strong and so powerful, Lord. You mold us, Lord, with your love. You mold us and you shape us and you change us with your compassionate heart. And we're just grateful, Lord, with the way that you are so patient with us. Um, ask so that you would continue that process of molding and shaping us to be the Christians that we need to be. This world needs us, Lord, to be Christians in the mold of Christ. So, Lord, help us as we consider that this morning as we think about uh, relationships that we have with one another. Lord, as we consider this vertical relationship that we have with you, would you just uh, take all of these things and continue, Lord, to mold us and shape us um, as, as kindly, as gently, as patiently as you do. Thank you, Father. Amen. Well, so we've been making our way through the book of Romans. Uh, I've kept bringing up the context, the conflict that Paul is writing into. Uh, this struggle between Jewish and Gentile Christians over how, how they ought to live and what their churches ought to teach. Uh, Paul's been really busy in this letter, clearing out all of the clutter out of the way. He acknowledges the sinfulness that exists among Gentiles and all of humanity in chapter 1. He then spend, spills quite a bit of ink uh, to make it plain that Christ has done for the Jews what the law could never do for them to save them. Christ is sufficient, and all people need his redemption. Even the most righteous, the most pious Jew needs Jesus Christ. Paul's clearing the air to make room for, in, the, in the church for the gospel. Paul isn't going to let anything hinder the gospel, and I want to do the same. Another way of looking at this, and this is how Romans is sometimes taught, is that Romans 1 through 4 is really all about how a person is saved. And then Romans 5 would be this assurance of that salvation. And then Romans 6, that we're going to start in today, would be about how Christians should then live. And that's a good start, because today's passage does have, a, have something to say about Christian ethics. But it's not a complete picture. Paul's going to argue that the problem of the human condition runs much deeper than some guilt and some bad behavior. It runs deeper than just having a representative in Adam who chose sin, as we talked about last week. Remember that from last week? We talked about how faith is a change in representation, a change from Adam as our representative to Jesus Christ. Um, Paul's going to argue in this chapter that, that the change that's needed from unbelief to belief in Christ 
is so much more significant and so much more important than becoming slightly more ethical, than doing a few more things right. It's not just a few more ticks towards goodness. That's not the change that's needed. Paul's going to say that before a, Christian, uh, before a person enters into a relationship with Christ, the Redeemer, the, the Savior, the chain smasher that Jesus is, that person before that point is enslaved, marked, and owned to and by sin. Christian faith does not merely hand out a pamphlet for how to live a better life. That's not the Christian life. That's not the purpose of the church, and that's not my job, to hand out a pamphlet on how to, how to live a little bit better. It's a change of ownership. It's a change in what we serve, what we live for. A conviction that I carry deep within me is that we have often done a bad job of explaining the gospel to the world. What is the Christian life? If our answer is living better, we have painted a shallow picture. What Paul does instead, beginning in chapter 6 and continuing on through the middle of chapter 8, is to trace the path of freedom, not only from sin's penalty, but from its power. Paul asks a new question. To whom do we belong? And that question will shape how we live and how our world perceives us. It ought to shape everything that we do from here on out. This is so much bigger than just ethics. This is so much bigger than living better. This is about a relationship with God in whom we live and move and have our being. Like someone assisting a confused visitor at one of those floor plan maps they have at big malls. Uh, we're from Minnesota. We go to the Mall of America. Uh, don't go there. It's a complete waste of your time. It's just there's like four gaps instead of one. Uh, it's just horrible. It's this massive place. But boy, do they need maps there because it's just a circle with like three or four stories all the way around, and it's so easy to get lost. What Paul is doing in, in, in this, particularly in this chapter, as he's standing at that, that map and he's, he's, he's pointing out to confused visitors coming that don't know where they are, that little spot on the map, my favorite little spot on those maps that says, you are here. It is so comforting to know. I might be a long way away from where I'm going, but I, I at least know I am here. And that's a starting point. I can do something with that because there's an escalator over there and I can see that on the map too. And I, at least I have a direction. It's wonderful to know you are here. So that's what, that's what Paul's doing. I need to under, us to understand how, how vitally important this is. Christ has not merely come to make us more ethical. Christ has not merely come to make us choose good instead of bad. Growing up, I had a board game that I'm sure my mom got for me. Uh, it was a Christian board game. And so you know it was just riveting to play this. Uh, it was this Adventures in Odyssey game. Uh, I think it was called Sticky Situations or something like that. Uh, and I will say this of that game, it was well intended. It was well intended. Um, every space that you lay in, you'd roll the dice. I'm surprised I was allowed to roll the dice as a good Baptist boy. We, every time you roll the dice and you'd move your, your thing to a certain number of spaces, and whatever space you landed on, you'd draw a card that had a different scenario on it. And you had to give the right answer. Okay? Uh, one scenario would be something like, you have a paper due tomorrow for school. Should you stay home and diligently work on your paper or blow it off to go hang out with your friends? Or your friends invited you to go see a movie that you know your parents wouldn't approve of. Should you go or bake cookies instead? And every question was so obvious what the right Christian answer was that it wasn't a game at all. It was just this... And so, and so if, you, if you gave the right answer, you had to move forward a few spaces. And if you gave the wrong answer, you'd move back a few. And I, I remember playing this, my little sister and, my, with, and I with my mom. And every now and then, we'd, just, we'd give the wrong answer just, cause, just to spice it up a little bit. <laughs> Again, well-intentioned. But if that's all we tell our kids, if that is what Christianity is, doing right things, avoiding consequences, keeping up appearances, then we will have trained kids who are absolutely lost in the mall. 
We need someone to come alongside us gently, lovingly, to let us know you are here. Jesus made the right moves. He made all of the right moves. From here on out, you are free from everything that you have said and done. From here on out, you are invited to continue to serve, but it'll be in service to the God who knows you by name and loves you more intimately than anyone else. You won't be so much commanded to do right as you will long to do right. Our prayer will be less, God, help me do good, and more, Help me to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Ephesians 3, 18 and 19. Because if you're in Christ, the rest will follow. If you know what he's done for you, if you know you are here with God, loved by him, Christian ethics will come. Please don't hear from me today that Christian ethics don't matter. I'm saying they'll come. I'm saying they'll come if, we love, if we're in relationship with God. Christian ethics will come, and we can talk about them, but this is a much larger, much richer reality than do's and don'ts, don'ts, rights and wrongs. And so we begin today with just the first two verses of Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. Why are those who have died to sin? We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Confident from the life we found in Christ from chapter 5, Paul is prepared to answer anyone who's ready to question what he said in 520. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Paul's a human being too, who doesn't always do what he wants to do, uh, as we'll find soon in chapter 7. A person like you and I, who is just as tempted to do the easy thing and the selfish thing. If we're assured of salvation, then why do really hard things? Why be obedient when we don't want to? Shall we go on sinning so that grace will increase? By no means, Paul says. He leaves no room for discussion. God has given us hope for the future, but we're not supposed to use that hope as a license to do whatever is pleasing to our own eyes. The life with God, the life with God forever, starts now. God is invested in transforming the way that we live while we have breath in our lungs. As Paul started to do at the beginning of chapter 5, he again picks up this imagery of slavery and mastery and freedom to make his point. We shouldn't be slaves to sin any longer because, Paul says, we have died to sin. Now, what does that mean? Because... I've heard a ton of different interpretations of this, of of having died to sin. There are Christians today that believe that this means that Christians, true Christians, Christians with enough faith, aren't even tempted by sin anymore. So if sin is still tempting you, you should really probably question your salvation. But we know that isn't true, and we'll see in just a little bit, verses 11 through 14. It's absolutely not true that Christians are no longer tempted by sin. If that were the case, Scripture would waste very little time telling us to avoid sin, telling us to deny ourselves. It wouldn't need to. We are still tempted by sin. So what does it mean to have died to sin? Well, Paul uses the imagery of death, I would argue, for two reasons. First, it creates this obvious point of contact with the death of Christ. It connects us with him. Second, it's a powerful image of the decisive change of state. Again, this is not a few ticks up on a a little closer to goodness. It's a decisive change. When someone puts their faith in Christ, Paul implies, the change in their relationship to sin is as dramatic as a change from life to death or death to life. So this salvation is not just a legal change. Well, you were guilty, but now you're not. It's a change in your very being and in your relationship with God. Through Christ, God has extended grace to us. The idea of remaining in sin is kind of like remaining stuck at the bottom of a well. Uh, I grew up with Lassie. I I don't remember much about that show. It seems like somebody was just always stuck in a well. I think that's the only danger on the prairie. And I'm surprised it never happened to me. 
But imagine being stuck at the bottom of a well and a rope is lowered down to you. This is grace. This is what grace looks like. Grace is designed to get us out of that situation. Here's the problem. It's not made to make us feel more comfortable at the bottom of the well. Because we know there's, there's rope there. I can apparently get out any time that I want. Grace is made... To get, grace is designed, is planned, is sent to us to get us out of that situation, out of the bottom of the well. Paul is adamant that for a Christian, it isn't a choice of whether they should be complacent with sin or not. And that needs to be one of our biggest takeaways here. Paul does not command us, die to sin. That's not what it says. It, does, it is not a command. It is not an imperative. He does not command, die to sin. As though that's something we can accomplish. As though that's something we can participate in. He says, we have died to sin. We are the ones. We are the people who by faith in Christ, he has done this. We are dead to sin. We are the ones who have died to sin. For believers in Jesus, sin is no longer our status, our state, or our master. A sign of a believer is that they have died to sin. Commentator Michael Byrd uh, wrote that you cannot reside in sin land when the government posts your obituary in its local newspaper. It's not possible. Why would you then remain there anyway when you recently received a letter notifying that you've just inherited Graceland, complete with Elvis memorabilia? I don't think I've ever talked to you about Michael Byrd. He's probably my favorite commentator. Um, He's a fantastic explainer of theology. His humor is the driest of the dry, though. Uh, we would groan in seminary reading Michael Byrd's stuff. Uh, his book, Evangelical Theology, is one of my favorite systematic theologies, but you often find yourself wondering, was he trying to be funny just there? I think so, but I'm not sure. I'll, I'll, I'll quote more from him in Romans, because he's got some great stuff on Romans. But he makes a great point, though. Sin cannot have the same pull on us. In fact, it, it, if Scripture is true, Christians have truly died to sin. It, it cannot have the same pull on us. It cannot have the same ownership of us. So let's look at that truth. Three through seven. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too, excuse me, may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we which should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. This is one of the most important passages in Scripture on baptism. But why does he even bring it up? That's my question as I'm reading this this week. Why even bring up baptism? Um, why is that the direction Paul goes here? Well, the Greek word for baptism, baptizo, means immersed in. So verse 3, Woodenly would say, those immersed in Jesus Christ. Not those who've just heard about him. Not those who just have some pertinent, inf pertinent information about who Jesus is and what he's done. Those who are immersed in Christ are immersed into his death. I would argue that in this passage, Paul is using baptism as sort of a stand-in for the whole of our conversion in Christian life. We die with him. We were buried with him. And we will therefore be raised with him. Baptism is a picture of all of that. Baptism is a stand-in for this entire conversion, for this immersion into Jesus Christ. In fact, and this is something that I've never heard a sermon on before, Jesus spoke of his death as a coming baptism for him. Did you know that? He spoke of his coming death as a baptism for him. And he does it twice. In Mark 10, 38, and then in Luke 12. Here's the Luke passage. Luke 12, 49 to 50. I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled, but I have a baptism to undergo. I have a baptism to undergo. 
And what constraint am I under until it is completed? For Paul, baptism was not merely this empty symbol. Baptism is about the reality of being united with Christ in his death. That's how he spoke of it. We choose solidarity with our Savior and place our identity in him. Paul would write of this in Galatians 2. Listen to these powerful words. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Does this look like ethics to you? Does this look like living a slightly better life to you? Does this look like a smile on the face to you? Or does this look like a dramatic, dramatically different way of life? Paul says that we are buried with Christ. A burial is a decisive end to something. I've done a number of funerals, and It's always fascinating to me. I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the intricacies of different things, the, the, the things that are emphasized, the things that are withheld. The, the, and, and at a funeral, I'm always, it's always interesting. People, in my experience, have tended to do a pretty good job holding things together during the service. Uh, I love, <laughs> this is a total rabbit trail I didn't mean to go on, but I, I, I personally love doing funerals because at a wedding, they're looking for the pastor to get out of the way. And at a funeral, they came because they, they want to hear from you. They came specifically to see you. And uh, I take that as a, a great privilege. Um, but people tend to hold things together pretty well in the service. But when we get out there to the burial, and, and I'm reading these words from Scripture of, of the end of life, there's a finality to it. Their dust is returning to dust. It is a difficult and a... And a powerful image. There's, a, it, it, there's this finality. This is as far as we see. And we have to trust God with the rest of eternity. I will not speak to this person again until Christ, uh, until Christ returns. So Paul is saying we are buried with Christ. A burial is decisive. It is an end. It is a finish. In this case, an, an end to the life with this old master, sin. So it is impossible to go on sinning if you are dead and buried to a life of sin. Paul goes on, uh, Romans 8, uh, 6, 8 through 11. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. Often when we read scripture, we think of any given statement, any given verse, as either a command or a truth. It's either something that, we, uh, something that we're supposed to do, a command, or it's something that we're supposed to believe, a truth. But often, like in this case, it's both. That's why Paul talks about both believing in verse 8 and knowing in verse 9. Dying and rising with Christ is something that is true of us and something that needs to be made true of us as well. It is a reality in us that requires more action by us. The good news is Christ is the model for us. Look at this verse. Spend some time this week on this verse Romans 6.10. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. It's done. It's finished. But the life he lives, he lives to God. That's the model for us. That's the model for us. Christ has done it. It's sufficient. It's done. Salvation is secure. Now there's a life to live. Now live into that. You are made a Christian. You are declared righteous by God. Now live into it the rest of your days. Uh, I've always, I'm sure I've mentioned this before, it's, but it's the best model that I've ever seen for sanctification. Sanctification is this huge word that just means once, you're a, once you become a Christian, a Christ follower, you spend the rest of your life looking, trying to look more and more like Christ, participating in God's regenerative work of making us more Christ-like. I love the image of that as like what happens at a wedding. 
On a wedding day, a, a man is declared a husband. A, wife, a woman is declared wife. The, the, there's no significant you know, change that happens other than those words are spoken. But the rest of your life, you are living into that role. The rest of your life is yours to prove that you are not just a husband, you are a good husband. The rest of your life, you are not just a wife, you are a good wife. That is sanctification. What Christ has done is done, and it is good, and it is sufficient. He has saved you, and he alone. Now we have the opportunity to live into that with the rest of our days. We'll talk more about that. Boy, where was I? The sacrifice is once and for all. Having defeated death, having nullified sin, Christ continues to live to the glory of God. That's the model for us. That's the truth for us. We are free, truly, finally, and definitively free from the lure and the lordship of sin. But let's bring this down to application for a second. You and I are not the risen Christ. We are not him. We will not live perfectly after our conversion. We're still tempted by sin, and we still fall into it every single day. And so did Paul, as we'll see in the next chapter. We're not Jesus. That's why we count ourselves. He uses the word count. We count ourselves to be dead to sin. We are not fully and finally dead to sin. But here's the important part. Here's the Christian life application part. We need to start living like we are. We need to start living like we are dead to sin. We need to live a life that shows we don't belong here. We need to burn our passport renounce our citizenship to sin land, forget the language, and long for home. Chrysostom put it this way, only let us go, leave the strange and foreign land, for this is what sin is, drawing us far away from the Father's house. Let us leave her then, that we may speedily return to the house of our Father. Finally, 12 through 14. Therefore, because of all of this, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. The temptation to sin is ever-present. Otherwise, there would be no command to not let it reign in our bodies. But we shouldn't obey the old master. Why? Well, because we don't belong to that old way anymore. The old master of sin. But also, also, really important, if you want to know why, you know, why Paul's answer, answering this whole question of not why, why should we give up sin if grace is going to cover it anyway, also, because whatever is hindered, whatever is tied down, whatever is shackled in your life can't be used as an instrument in service to God and to others. The Hebrew people were enslaved in Egypt for 430 years, according to Exodus 12. 430 years of being told what they were going to do every day. 430 years of choice stripped away. 430 years of suffering, of working for Pharaoh to Pharaoh's pleasure. 430 years of servitude. And they were freed from that slavery. One day a slave and the next day they weren't. But here's the thing about slavery. It took them a long time not to feel like slaves anymore. That first generation died in the desert still feeling like slaves. You are not a slave to sin anymore. What's it going to take for you to not feel like a slave to sin? What's it going to take for you to believe that you can say no to the temptations that have been pestering you for years and years and years? This chapter ends with the word grace. The whole title of this sermon is In View of God's Mercy. Some of us need some grace. For the, for, the, for the battle that we're in with our own sin and our own temptation. This chapter ends with the word grace, this rope that God has extended to us when we were slaves to sin. 
I mentioned before that this grace is, is like a rope extended to us in a deep well. It was not intended to make us more comfortable where we are. But I think sometimes it does. I think sometimes we grow com- complacent, used to the muck at the bottom of the well. Do you know what God has for us outside of this well? Do you know all the people that need help getting out of their own wells? If you climb out of this one, you will be the perfect person to help another person get out of their well. Perfect person. You will be understanding and compassionate. You will care deeply for them. You know what's outside of the well. And you can tell them about it. And you can make sure that they know that it was God and God alone that got you out of your well. Do you know what sort of relationship is waiting for you outside of the well? I've said it before and I'll say it again. Passivity is the great sin of man. Passivity and complacency. We cannot afford to be complacent about our sin. We cannot afford to waste our life wondering what it's like outside of the well. God has more for us, a desire to have a relationship with us. And as Paul tells us in this chapter, no Christian is enslaved to sin. We need to not merely be comforted by the rope. We need to grab a hold of it and climb up. There's a story about Alexander the Great, and I believe it's a true story. One night, Alexander, one of the greatest military minds who has ever lived, was out on another one of his military campaigns. And this particular night, he was tossing and turning, having some trouble sleeping. So he got up and he left his tent and uh, he took a walk around the campsite, just kind of inspect the defenses and, I don't know, give his mind a little peace. And as he walked around the campsite, he came across a young soldier at a post uh, who was sleeping. This was a major no-no. Uh, This was a serious breach of security that could have resulted in endangering the entire camp. So serious was this offense that in those days, this would have been punishable by death. Alexander angrily roused this young man from his slumber and began to berate him. The young soldier was terrified to be startled awake, let alone by Alexander the Great. I would be, I can't even imagine And Alexander asked him, do you know what the penalty is for falling asleep while on guard duty? Yes, sir. And Alexander asked him, what is your name, soldier? Alexander, he replied. My name is Alexander. And Alexander the Great was annoyed at this, and seemingly he was just in disbelief. He repeated the question to this young soldier three times. What is your name? And every time he answered, my name is Alexander. Finally, Alexander the Great said sternly, if your name is Alexander, then either change your name or change your behavior. Romans 6 challenges us that we need to honor Christ by the way that we live. You are made in his image and you represent him everywhere that you go to everyone that you see. You bear his name. You work for him. We have to be consistent between what we affirm with our mouths and what we do with our hands. One of the first martyrs of the church, Ignatius of Antioch, asked others to pray for him in such a way. Pray that I may not merely be called a Christian, but actually prove to be one. Let that rest on you a little bit this week. If we've been crucified with Christ and if we have truly died to sin, we can count ourselves as dead to sin and offer ourselves in service to God and to others. Doing that is proof that Jesus is our Lord and we are his servants. Let us not merely be called Christians. Let us prove to be followers of this Christ. Would you pray with me? Lord, with malice toward none and charity toward all, would you help us to resemble you? Lord, um, I, uh, as a young man growing up, in, growing up in the Christian culture in which I was raised, I feel like one of my main takeaways is all men struggle. 
All men struggle with things. And I, I know there's truth there. All human beings struggle with things. I know. I know that's real. I know that that's true. Lord, help us to believe that, that there is something more for us. That there is something more, Lord, to this life than the muck at the bottom of this well. Help us, Lord, to know that there is, there is a relationship with you. That you, Lord, are the sort of Savior that, that takes the... The, the, the garment that you've been wearing and you sit us down and you wash the, 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 the grime off of our feet, Jesus Christ. When we come in on a Sunday morning, Lord, you meet us here. You desire, Lord, for us to not merely be clean. Sometimes the challenge is for us to know that we're clean. Lord, you have made us free. You declare us free people. Lord, Lord, what will it take to shake us out of our complacency? What will it take for us to believe you at your word? That you are the sort of God who has made us clean. Jesus, help us to know that, that, that we might be more helpful to other people. That we might be the ones standing for a, with a confused generation, generations, pointing at a map to say, we are here with God. And this is what's possible. This is what God has done for me. Thank you, Father, Lord, that you are not ambivalent toward us, that you are not, Lord, a God who is far off. You see us, you know us, you know the needs that exist in our own household, you know the needs of our neighbors. Lord God, help us to be instruments of your kindness and of your righteousness. Thank you for all that you've done. Help us believe you. Help us believe you at your word that we might not just be ethical people, but that we would be people that remind our world of Christ. Thank you, Father. Amen.